Hi, everyone. This is Alex, uh, and we have David from uh, SIA today. Uh, and David will uh, present us uh, the technology, and we will, we'll, we will go through it. Uh, and so to start, can you introduce yourself uh, and uh, walk through the uh, what's uh, powering SIA, the technology? Sure. Uh, yes, my name is David Vork. Uh, I co-founded SIA um, with Luke Champagne in 2014. Um, I've been in the Bitcoin space, slash like observing, studying, tracking Bitcoin since 2011. Uh, so it's been uh, a long time and a, an exciting journey for me. Um, SIA is a decentralized cloud storage platform. Um, we really took inspiration from Bitcoin and the idea that you can create uh, a banking infrastructure or a financial infrastructure with no trusted third party. Um, and so we asked the question, could this be applied to something else? Um, and in the case of SIA, we're, we're applying that to you can create a cloud storage platform that has no trusted third party. Um, and so our goal is to be able to make it for you to put data into the cloud uh, without having to give up control to, like, say, an Amazon or an Apple or a Google. Um, we, want, we want you to be able to use the cloud without having to trust anyone else. Um, and, and SIA launched in 2015. We've been building and enhancing it ever since. Uh, and I do think we've achieved the goal at this point of uh, decentralized cloud storage. So I would say that it's here today, it works, um, and you can try it out. Cool. So let's, uh, let's dive into the tech. OK. Um, so the first thing to know is that size of proof of work blockchain. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to write at this exact moment, but um, it is a consensus system uh, very similar to Bitcoin. We have one uh, special edition called the file contract. Um, so rather than use a like whole smart contracting platform, um, we thought the complexity was high. We felt to make the SIA network, we really only needed one decentralized primitive or one like smart contract. Um, and so we just made that, like built that right into the chain. Um, so we have something called the file contract. Um, and what a file contract is, is an agreement between a, uh, a renter and a host, uh, I'll go ahead and spell them out, um, who each put money, I'll just draw a dollar sign, um, into a file contract. And of course, it's not US dollars, it is uh, SIA coins. So what this does is this file contract has a size and a Merkle root in it. Um, and so the size is how much data is in there. The Merkle root is the Merkle root of the data. So we take, we take the data and we Merkleize it. We put it into a Merkle tree. We take the root and we put that here. And so the size for this guy would be four. Um, and then. And those are bytes? Or like how big is that? Yeah, each so leaf? Each, each leaf is a 64 byte, uh, 64 byte set of data that you hash. Um, and then so each each node or branch is 32 bytes of data. Um, and then, of course, the root is, is 32 bytes. Um, so yeah, you hash 64 bytes into a 32-byte leaf, then you combine all the leafs into a root. Um, so oh, and then, and then there's a, uh, a time. Uh, we call it a start time and an end time. Uh, we'll come, come back to time in a moment. Um, so what the money is is money from the renter. This is getting paid to the host. Um, so as long as the host is honest and delivers on the file storage promise, the host will get this money. Um, and then, yeah, this money from the host is actually like it's collateral. So it's a promise to the renter. If I don't deliver on my promise to store the data, I will forfeit this money. And so if the host succeeds, all the money goes to the host. If the host fails, all the money gets destroyed. Um, and oh, they don't go to the renters, for example. No, they get mm -hmm. destroyed. And this is um, a game theory optimization. What we don't want is if, if the money goes back to the renter, and let's say the renter has some pretty big storage bills, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars owed to hosts, now the renter has a incentive to make the hosts fail. The, the renter can get substantial revenue or substantial cash back by seeing the host fail. Um, so we want to make sure that there's never any incentive to attack the host. Nobody wins when the host loses. Oh, you're saying a renter is AWS, for example. Yeah. Or like someone who hosts hosts. 
Yeah. I see. Um, and so we don't we don't want anyone to be able to make money by harming hosts. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why the money gets destroyed. There's well, no revenue to be had by you make a little bit of host. revenue, right? Because total supply reduces. But it's, it, yeah, it's just not as much. I see. Yeah, um, it, it's much more indirect, mm -hmm. and that would require a much much yeah. bigger attack <laughs> to be profitable. Um, okay, so we'll dive into the start time and end time. Uh, so this is this is how how do we know that the host is storing the data? So the host has this Merkle root that uh, a Merkle root in size that describe the data that's being stored, and a start time and end time. Um, so the start time might be, let's say, 10,000 blocks in the future. And the end time might be 10,288 blocks in the future. Some quick context. Um, SIA blocks are 10 minutes, just like Bitcoin. So 288 blocks is uh, two days. Um, so the start time is when the host has the opportunity to provide a storage proof. And the end time is when the network assumes that the host was unable to provide the storage proof. Um, so we don't want the host to provide a storage proof earlier, because then that doesn't uh, the host hasn't stored the data for for enough time, hasn't fulfilled their commitment. But we want to make sure they have you know the more than one block, because it can be hard to get a you know a transaction into a single block. So we give them we give them some time to get the proof onto the blockchain. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and erase this. Um, the way the proof itself is structured. Um, do, do they periodically submit proofs? Just one. Just one. OK. Um, and we'll come back to why that is. Um, but I'll go ahead and make eight. So we have a uh, Merkle tree. And let's say it's block. Uh, so let's say the start height, SH, EH, is 10,000. 10, and the end height is 10,288. Um, what's going to happen is at height, 999, uh, 9,999, we're going to take the hash of that block. So we're going to get, you know, uh, equals, you know, A, B, C, D. We're going to take the hash of this, H of A, B, C, D. Um, and we're going to turn that into a random number, RNG. We're going to use the random number to select uh, one of these at random. So let's say this one gets chosen. So now the host has to provide a proof on uh, this node that he has this data in particular. So this, if you remember, corresponds to 64 bytes. So the host is going to provide this 64 bytes, not the hash of them, but, but the actual bytes themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and the then also going to provide uh, let's see, what would, what would that be? That would be these. Mm -hmm. The Merkle proof that the 64 bytes belongs in the Merkle root in the contract. Um, and so this is a probabilistic proof. If the host can present this proof, then we accept it as though the host proved they have all the data. If the host cannot present this proof, uh, then we assume the host doesn't have any data at all. Even if mm -hmm. they have other, the host yeah. has no, has one, one chance to prove they have this data. And that happens. OK, so because they're using a hash of the previous block, then the proof will be submitted like at this block or shortly after. Or it has to be submitted at this height exactly. It has to be submitted in this range. Um, oh, oh, that's a range yeah, in this which is a the, range. the proof needs to arrive. I see. Yeah. Um, and so if, if we get to 10,288 and no proof has shown up yet, mm -hmm. then uh, the contract will destroy all the money. Mm -hmm. If we do get a proof in this range, though, uh, obviously, because we use this block to figure out what, what the challenge is, the host's unable to provide a proof until this height, mm -hmm. because the host doesn't know where the challenge is going to be. This is a secure random number. Um, but why? So, so let's say host also happens to be one of the miners. Can yep. they not grind? Well, I guess it's expensive. It's a good question. Uh, yes. So, and that's, that's precisely the argument. So the hash of a block is a secure is a secure random number in the sense that it's expensive to try again. And each time, if you don't like the random number you get, you can roll again. And it's going to cost you whatever the block reward is. So if the block reward is, say, $400, it's going to cost you $400 to try and get a random, another random yeah. number. Now, if you're, the network's busy, if you're a host with, say, uh, 200 storage proofs, 
and you have a random number that, that selects on all 200, what are the chances that you're going to roll another random number if you're trying to cheat? What are the chances that your next random number is going to be good across mm -hmm. all 200 contracts? Um, so if you do the, the math out, basically um, the upper bound on how safe it is, like you, if you make a, you know, a $200 million contract on the Sci Network today, which I think does uh, several hundred dollars per block, uh, is, is how much it costs to, to do a block on the Sci Network today, that's probably a bad idea. But mm -hmm. if you have contracts even that are you know, in the thousands of dollars, uh, probabilistically, it, it should be fine. It's more expensive to manipulate the random number, even if you mm -hmm. assume a 100% minor, yep. than it is to just store all the data. Mm -hmm. um, cheating is very expensive. So the other the other trick that we use is the collateral. Um, so we can we can prove that as long as the host is putting up uh, more than one x collateral, the expected value of cheating is lower than the expected value of, or the, yeah, the expected penalty of cheating is lower than the expected cost of just continuing to store the data. Mm -hmm. um, and so one uh, like subtle corner of the network is actually when the price drops, because the reward is tracked in Sciacoin. So if the Sciacoin price goes way down, the host reward goes way down. So if you have, let's say, like a collateral that's 2x the revenue, um, we can say like you know 1,000 Sciacoins of revenue, 2,000 side coins of collateral, and the price drops to minus uh, 50%, the, the price falls in half, the host reward um, the host reward is halved and the host collateral is halved, this ratio is still safe. Mm -hmm. If you're doing like 1,000 and, and 1,000, this ratio may not be safe. Because now, now that it's fallen in half, the host can go to someone else and get 2,000 side coins for the same amount of storage. Um, and so you want your collateral multiple to, you want to take into account network volatility. Um, so this is one thing where uh, Saya tries to avoid volatility in its token price. If we could have a stable coin, I think that would be best of all. Um, at this point, we don't have one. Um, but the more volatile the network is, the higher you need the collateral to be, just because mm -hmm. the host can go and, and get a better deal by reselling the hard drive. But if the collateral is 2x and the price goes down three times, then it's yeah, not safe. Then, right? it's, then it's not safe. And that actually is a function of how old the contract is. So if the contract is like uh, has 3% transpired, then probably not safe. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the contract is 99% transpired, the host only has to, or even like 50% transpired, the, the host only has to hold the data for half the time of the contract. If they go to someone else, they're going to have to spend, uh, you know, say, double uh, mm -hmm. or yeah, that someone else is going to have to uh, compensate for more time. Right. Um, and so here, uh, so the start start hash, that's the start time. Height. Start height. Start height, sorry. This is the time at which the renter does not need data anymore, right? Yes. So the data is stored up until the start height, at which point the host once provides the hash, then yeah. the proof. I, I see. And so the renter should assume that as soon as, as, soon as this height hits, the host is going to make the proof and delete the data. Mm -hmm. um, and in reality, the host is going to wait a little bit in case there's a reorg or something. So the mm -hmm. host does wait to submit the proof. But right. the renter has no control over that. The host doesn't have to wait, uh, depending on the host's model of the network. But now, now the host has two, two kinds of expenses, right? They store data, but they also serve data. Yes. So, so what makes them serve data? Yeah. So that is purely a revenue-based thing. Um, so every time that you. We've tried to st structure the SIA network so that every time you spend resources on the SIA network, uh, you pay for them. So right. upload bandwidth, download bandwidth, storage cost, uh, contract fees, right? The, the host has to get a storage proof onto the blockchain. That's a resource that the host, uh, that's a cost that the host incurs when it enters into a file contract. So the renter actually prepays for that. Um, so for bandwidth, renters pay for the hosts every time they download. Mm -hmm. um, and then data availability is actually one of the one of the bigger challenges of the Sci network. The only um, so one one thing we can't do is a decentralized trustless proof of data delivery. Um, so if I'm a third party, like any anyone looking at the blockchain, anyone trying to verify the blockchain is a third party. So if you and I, if you're a host and I'm a renter, and I say to the network, he's not sending me the data, 
but then every time I try and like, this is the data he's not sending me and you just proved it, you, you proved the network that you have it, um, there's no way for me to prove that you are not sending the data. You can always, you can always withhold until the last second and then give it to me, or uh, I could just fr like falsely claim that you're not sending me the data. Um, and we can't resolve who's, who's being honest in a disagreement like that. Um, so we have to use other means then we can't, we can't slash people for not making data available because we can't prove that they are actually not making data available. Um, we can only prove whether or not they're actually storing it. Mm -hmm. um, so what we do instead is we fall back on redundancy. So we store, this is, uh, this is its own thing. So I think we move on for file contracts for now. We will come back to um, state channels. So our file contracts are actually state channels. This is a scalability optimization, um, and a super important one that, that is like fundamental to making SIA scalable. Um, but where we're, oh, redundancy. OK, so every single, we use something called Reed Solomon coding. Um, it's a k of n redundancy scheme. So I'll take a piece of data. I'll split it up into k pieces. On the sign network today, it's uh, 10 of 30. I'm going to go ahead and draw uh, 2 of 6, just because it's less things to draw. Um, so we end up with, I'll do it this way. Um, so we end up with six pieces of data. Out of these six pieces of data, uh, two of them, and it doesn't matter which two, are all I need to reconstruct uh, the original data. So we fragment the file out uh, in a 2 of 6 scheme. So uh, we can pick any value we want for k and n up to on most libraries. Uh, this is not a. Like 255? 255, that's correct. Um, 0 to 255. And that's just because most libraries don't, don't support bigger values. Um, so we pick 10 of 30 on the SI network. Uh, the redundancy overhead. This is called a maximum distance separable code. Um, is n divided by k. Uh, so on the sign network, that would be 30 divided by 10 equals 3x. Uh, 3x redundancy. So it's it's basically the same overhead as doing a 1 of 3 to do a 10 of 30. But the difference is, instead of needing uh, in a 1 of 3, you're hosed if you get three rare events. Three, three hosts are not responsive. Um, in a 10 of 30, you don't get a failure until you have uh, 21, 21. Yep. rare events or 21 failures. And so probabilistically, um, one is exponentially better than the other. As you increase the total number of pieces for a fixed redundancy, um, your robustness goes way up. But for a particular host, uh, so let's say there's nothing else, right, in the network. Then for a particular host, it is it is beneficial not to serve files, right? No, because uh, if you are not serving files, you are missing out on revenue because you get paid to serve files. But I, uh, I see. So okay, so let so let's say the, so there's the renter and the host, right? So the renter says, uh, please serve me a file. Yep. Here's some uh, money. Uh, but I'm not giving you the file. Yep. So so why would I not get the revenue? Oh, because uh, so this is where this is where payment channels come in. Mm -hmm. So the way our payment channels work, uh, we're going to go ahead and accept this as solved. So, so far, it feels to me that at least one of them should be able at some point to, to trick the other. Right, so, so either, so between you and I, one of, let's say you're a renter, I'm a hoster, right? Yep. There's the moment when I, uh, when you actually receive the file, and yep. there's a moment when you release the payment to me. Yep. There's no way that is atomic, right? So That's one of those must happen before the other. So actually, there is a way to make that atomic. I'm not going to go into it, because it's not how we do it. <laughs> okay. um, so we, we do something called packetized payments. Um, so what the renter, and I'll just go ahead and use the numbers typically. So the renter is going to send payment. Uh, the first step is the renter sends payment. Oh, but it's a small payment. Yeah, four, four megabytes. Oh, you're doing interledger. Yes, although we predate interledger. Uh, so we've had this live since before the interledger protocol was devised. Uh, this, this came out in, I think, August 2015 on the SCI network. Um, so then we trust the host mm -hmm. for four megabytes worth of payment. Yep. Then the host sends four megabytes. 
mm -hmm. and we do it again. Um, yeah. And so if we're downloading a one gigabyte file, we're going to run this circle a bunch of times. If at any point the host uh, takes our payment and doesn't give us data, now mm -hmm. we know it's a bad host. Yep. Um, and because we're talking to 30 different hosts, mm -hmm. um, one, this gives us super, super high parallelism. So even if each host is pretty slow, Mm -hmm. As an aggregate, the throughput is super high. Um, yeah. And since, since we've been doing 10 of 30, which is also many years, um, the bottleneck for speed has always been how fast your computer is and how fast our code is, not how fast the networks are. But also, if I remember right, how Reed Solomon libraries work, right? They, uh, so like if, if this is our six, uh, uh, six shares, right? Yep. Then each, each byte is encoded separately, right? So you don't really need to have two out of six full shares. For each particular byte, we need any two shares. Yeah. So the way we do, the way the sign network's structured, you do need a full. Full two out of six. But w for each chunk. So we, we chunk it. OK. Um, so and it's, actually, it's I the think, same thing, I guess. Yeah. Just the chunk is not one byte, I guess. Right. The chunk's not one byte. It is uh, 200 and. Uh, I think it's 64 bytes. Um, so I think our, our chunks are 64 bytes at the at the Reed Solomon level. Mm -hmm. At the network level, our chunks. So we take what we do with a large file. Let's say we have a four gigabyte file. Yep. Uh, we're going to take this four gigabyte file. We're going to split it into uh, basically. So the sector size on the network is four megabytes. So we're going to split it into sector size times uh, min redundancy, min redundancy. Which is 3x? No. Uh, oh, sorry, min, min, min pieces. Mm -hmm. Not min redundancy, min pieces, which is 10. Mm -hmm. We need 10 pieces to recover. Uh, so that would be Out of 30, equals yep. 10. Uh, 4 times 10 equals 40 megabytes. So we're going to turn this into 100 chunks of uh, 40 megabytes each. Mm -hmm. The chunk becomes 120 megs. Yep, that's correct. Operator coded. And so we uh, we call this the logical data. Mm -hmm. We we erasure code that into 120 megabytes of erasure coded data, and then each and this is of course sliced into four megabytes each. Mm -hmm. Each slice gets sent to a different spot on the side network. And and so e each of this is a separate file contract. Yes. Okay. Within one chunk. All right. So now we'll now we'll go to the payment channels, uh, state channels. I see. So, so if there was no state channels, each of those would result in on-chain transaction. Yes. I see. But because there are state channels, uh, really what you do is um, before we get into the technical details, you're going to pick 50 hosts. So again, I'll just draw uh, 5, 10, 10, 8, 9, 10. I don't know if that's 10. Four, six, eight, nine, ten. Okay, uh, and so we're going to have. We're going to put the renter up here. Uh, the renter is going to form a contract, a file contract, with each of the ten hosts. Now it looks like a spider. Happy Halloween. Um, and when we upload a file, each of these are a state channel. So we're going to use the state channel operation. We're going to update each of the file contracts to now include the new data. So mm -hmm. your average file upload results in zero on-chain transactions. That's assuming that the renter already has state channels open with all of them, right? Yes. So part of, the, part of the setup process for SIA, uh, the setup process is like one, uh, download, download client, or get it from whatever source you have to get SIA daemon. Two, sync chain, sync chain, three, Form contracts. So, so this op opens state channels. And yeah, this is this phase. Yeah. Um, and then for ready to go. So, so opening a state channel is an on-chain transaction, right? Yes. So we need to open. We need to. We need to create fifty on-chain transactions. Yes. To begin with. Yep. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and then once we have them, uh, we can use them to upload essentially an unlimited amount of data. Um, as far, as far as the protocol is concerned, as you saw, the, the file contract itself is a constant size. Mm -hmm. It just has a size and a Merkle root that scales infinitely. The storage proof is logarithmic. It's a Merkle tree proof. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't scale infinitely, but log uh, 
a logarithm in a finite universe is constant, right? Uh, <laughs> so by, by the time you're up to proof sizes of, I think, around 3 kilobytes, uh, well, you've exceeded what the it, universe it, it, can Isn't do. linear in a finite universe also constant? <laughs> Technically. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, you know, that's, that's fair. Um, but if, if you boil, if you say storage proofs are you know, always no more than four kilobytes, mm -hmm. um, that, that's bigger than all the data in the universe. Mm -hmm. So it, whereas linear, you're going to get much yeah. larger than that. Yeah, a little larger. Um, yeah, so, so the chain can handle effectively an, an infinite amount of data mm -hmm. uh, per file contract. And, and the largest proof size you'll ever practically see is four kilobytes. But the SIA client can't. There's a lot of. Uh, Metadata it has to manage. This mm -hmm. is actually something that we improved progressively. So, like when we first launched SIA, we actually didn't have the state channels up. Um, so the whole entire SIA network was good for about, I think, 10,000 files, uh, and the largest acceptable file was like 50 megabytes. Um, this was like, you know, 2015, and then uh, later in 2015, also in 2015, uh, we got it up to you know like 10 million files for the whole SIA network. And then you know maybe each file could be up to I think 200 megabytes. Um, today we're doing much better. So each each node, um, a single SIA node today is effectively good up to around 50,000 files uh, in a single node, and then around 20 terabytes in a single per node. Per file, oh, per node. Per, per node. Oh, there's no, there's no limit on the file size anymore. Uh, right. If it's a single yeah. file at 20 terabytes, you, you're probably still good. Mm -hmm. um, and then the 20 terabytes, most of that limit comes from the repair process. Uh, we're still ironing that out. We actually have we have an internal fix that we're going to push out. We don't know if this it bumps this number up or how much it bumps this number up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's early, but these this is what you can do today. And in theory, with like practical engineering, as we keep working on it, we think that uh, in the end, this number will be several million, and this number will be several petabytes per node. Uh, mm -hmm. No, like no problem. Yep. Um, so. One question I had was, uh, so let's say, <clears throat> so as a, as a host, I still get the reward even if, so, so even though I'm losing revenue from not serving a file, right? I'm still making some money because from it's the storage. still from the storage, right? Yes. So, so, so someone might contemplate the idea of having like a huge node which is not connected to the network or like to fast network yeah right because if I, ha if I have 20 terabytes of data uh, in principle that is uh, quite a bit right That's so, so I, I might choose not to have a network yeah um, well I guess yeah so but, but uh, rather my question is is there anything today in the CN network which would like for a particular renter uh, ban yes like some heuristics to ban hosts which uh, yeah so which we, are not we have a module that we call the host DB. Mm -hmm. uh, as the name suggests, it is a database of hosts. And the renter, so each renter has their own host DB. The blockchain, when a host wants to announce the network, it puts into the blockchain an announcement, I'm a host, here's my IP address, ask me uh, about my wares. And, uh, and so the renter will ping the host, get prices, availability, you know, whatever, uh, a bunch of statistics. And then, and then the renter keeps in its database uh, just a big list of how good each host is. Mm -hmm. And so if it's using, as it starts to use hosts, it gets better data. If it notices that a host is slower mm -hmm. seems, or, or is withholding data or is otherwise unavailable, it downranks it um, in the host DB. And so if you are but, having but trouble will, will it rehost? Will it rehost something that is currently hosted? So, so let's say yeah. I put this file for like 10 months. Yep. And like one month in, I realize that one of the hosts is uh, is so so. Yeah. It will so it automatically rehost it? It will. Yes. So that's called the repair process. Um, so let's say that the renter decides a particular host is bad, whether it's because it's offline, it increased prices, it you know there are there are a number of triggers that could cause the renter to decide a host is bad. Basically, what it does is it will when it wants to do a repair, it will download the file. So if we're if we're doing a ten of thirty scheme, it'll find ten pieces, download them reconstruct the original 30, and then whatever hosts need uh, replacing, it'll find new hosts and replace those. It'll only do that once 25% of the redundancy is missing. So 25% is missing. 
in, um, so the redundancy in our case is 20 pieces, right? We call them parity pieces. 20 parity pieces, I misspelled that, that's OK, uh, times 0 0.25 equals 5 pieces. Mm -hmm. So once a particular. Oh, not 25% of all the, of no, all the pieces, just 25% just yeah. of the parity. Um, so once five hosts are bad on a particular file, it will go ahead, download that file, replace those five pieces, mm -hmm. whichever, whichever five are the bad ones, it'll replace them, upload them to new hosts. Yeah. Um, and so the, the renter is constantly doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it churn. Just constantly doing this repair churn. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that uh, can be a scalability limitation if it's happening a lot. But for them, for the renter, th does it mean that renter can also stop the uh, file contract? So uh, the renter early? can stop uploading to the host. Uh, but the host, the renter already put money into oh, the contract. Oh, they already paid for it. Right. I see. So, so, so this, like that, that would result in a money loss for renter, right? Like for, for yes. sto they already paid for storage, which they're not using anymore. For, yeah, for some, some mm. amount of storage. Yep. Um, That's unfortunate. Yes. Be because I presume that, oh, but I see. So the, so, so let's say I'm, 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 I'm running a host machine. Yep. Right. And, uh, Oh yeah, so 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 that's that's what is not very nice, right? If I run a host machine, my host machine crashed, and I'm in Hawaii. Yes. I'm not in a particular hurry to recover it. I need to recover it the first time my next file contract expires, right? No. Um, so what's going to happen is, if you so the renters have certain expectations. We can get in, into those later, um, but I'll make I'll make a thing for it. Um, actually, I'll, I'll just go ahead and write them out. So mm -hmm. expectations. Uh, the big one is 95% uptime. Mm -hmm. Uptime per month. Um, so if you're offline for more than five percent of a single month, which is about one day, so you can you can afford to lose about one day of downtime in a row, uh, the renter will start to penalize you, and will start to churn you. And so if a renter is active, is constantly uploading new data, is constantly uh, repairing, if you're a host and you have downtime, all the renters who are using you are starting to downrank you. All oh, right. What, what I meant is that so so I will start losing revenue. What yeah. I meant is that for me to lose collateral, yes, uh, it's it's like it's not particularly pressing. I need to recover my restart my node before file contracts expire. Yes, because that's a way bigger loss for me, right? My collateral. Yep. yep. Then uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and generally speaking, if you're a busy host, um, I would expect you to have file contracts that turn up every oh, they, day. They constantly. Yeah. Uh, but as we said, that that window is about two days, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you still like it's intentional. That you're not in a super big hurry because we have we have 29 other hosts mm -hmm. that we can yeah, depend on, yep. um, and that's actually one of the reasons the network is so cheap, right? It's mm -hmm. so like Amazon, their data centers they have full-time engineers that are on site 24/7, awake, alert, uh, trained technicians. They know how to operate the data center. They have multiple ISPs, multiple power companies. Our hosts, it's fine if you go on vacation, right? And then the thing crashes mm -hmm. and you have to call your friend and get it to reboot it or whatever. Um, if if there's some like, if you're slower and have less uptime than a professional Amazon data center, this is seen as perfectly acceptable because you're not a single point of failure. Mm -hmm. While while you're down for you know 24 hours, we have 29 other people. Right. Um, but but presumably, behind behind the scenes on Amazon, there's also quite a bit of redundancy, right? Oh yeah, of course, of course. Um, so, so so for them, for them it's crucial that the uh, the proxy between you and Amazon. Is, is always life. Yes. But what is behind the scenes, that, that could be very redundant, right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, but in practice, keeping that proxy has a very high uptime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very expensive. Um, so, so, so expense what, we don't have. So one other thing where I cannot see anything bad happening yet, but because you thought more about it, you probably know if there's something happening there. Sure. Uh, when I send those things, right, some of those entities could be the same entity, right? Yes. Could they, because this is erasure code, that could, could they cheat in some way? Especially if it happens that many of them yeah. happen so to be the same entity. This yeah. gets into encryption. Um, so the process is we. Uh, oh, only I can recover. They cannot recover. We split the file, yeah, and then we encrypt it. I'll just do E, and then I'll put it into. I'll make it a. I'll make it a puff after encryption. Um, so even if all of these are the same host mm -hmm. and they each have one piece, 
uh, and they know that the pieces go together, they can't put them together because the encryption is applied after mm -hmm. the erasure coding. Yep. Um, so you cannot, the redundancy, the renter has perfect confidence that the redundancy can't be cheated. Mm -hmm. This comes with a trade-off, um, and this is actually like, this is, this is the trade-off that Sia makes that Filecoin does not make uh, that resulted in Filecoin doing, like requiring you know, tons of open research problems. So this, this is fairly easy, but it means that the renter or someone that the renter trusts with the encryption key is the only one able to do repair. Mm -hmm. So if the renter is like on vacation and you know three hosts disappear, or let's say, you know half half the hosts disappear, so now the renter's in trouble, mm -hmm. um, she needs to repair as fast as possible. If the renter's on vacation, yeah. the network can't repair on behalf mm -hmm. of the renter, um, because the network doesn't know what the encryption keys are. Mm -hmm. um, so either the renter themselves or someone that the renter has trusted the encryption keys to, has to be the one to do the repairs. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Filecoin has all these like deep research questions mm -hmm. that are open. How do we make it so that we can repair it without someone being able to cheat? And well, if you believe in magic, you can use SGX, right? That's, yes. Uh, that's one option. Uh, SGX, and they have a bunch of crypto protocols require trusted setup. Mm -hmm. uh, so similar similar assumptions to SGX, in my opinion. Um, regardless, we, we don't like that. Um, we do a pure, like, verifiable route. We make the trade off. Mm -hmm. The renter has to be around, or someone they trust has to be around to, to do file repairs. Mm -hmm. And that's just a limitation of the SIA network. If Filecoin figures out proof of replication one day, maybe we can move to it. And so in practice, mm -hmm. in SIA network, uh, network, are there participants who, like other, let's call them watchtowers, but I guess they're not real watchtowers. Like other entities whom, whom you give the, the key and they, and they will rec do redundancy for in you? In practice today, no. Okay. Um, those don't exist. We haven't needed them, mm -hmm. although maybe some like maybe someday there will be you will see that pop up. But, but also in practice, how frequently uh, do you observe? Or first of all, can you observe someone recover, doing churn from? Uh, from the so we can observe when we so we run our own nodes, right? Mm -hmm. So we can observe when we have to deal with churn. And of mm -hmm. course, we talk to our community. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of people run large nodes. And actually, right now, uh, again, we already have the fix for this uh, in. The lab, we're trying to push it out. Uh, we were trying to push it out this week. Didn't quite make it. Maybe next week. Uh, but right now, churn is actually fairly high on the SI network. Mm. And this is due to a scoring error. I um, see. What, what high is like how high? High would be like uh, maybe 25% per month. I see. Um, after, after the scoring fix, I think it will be closer to I predict it'll be closer to 5% per mm -hmm. month, which is still, you know, if you have 100 terabytes of data, that means you're repairing 5 terabytes a month. That's, mm -hmm. that's still fairly substantial. Um, but oh, we'll see. Um, so churn is definitely, like, from a scalability perspective, that's probably the biggest bottleneck, is how much repair bandwidth do you need per terabyte you put on the network mm -hmm. every month. And um, but that's, also that's a big this focus value, right now. This value 10 out of 30, is it hard coded or can I configure it? Like oh, it's fully configurable. OK, so if, if, I want to, if I want to go to Hawaii, I will just set it to 5 out of 100. Sure. And OK, so and like for pro probably for several months, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm um, paying more for storage, though. And in practice, uh, data that's unmaintained for a full month mm -hmm. at 10 of 30 is completely fine. Yeah. Uh, you, well, don't lose, yeah. you don't lose 21 in a single month. Normally, it would take three, three to six mm -hmm. months. Um, one other thing on the SIA network, file contracts are typically, they typically last around uh, three months. Mm. And so if you're gone for more than three months, all your file contracts expire, host delete all the data. Uh, you need to renew them. You need to let the host know you're still interested. You need to repay um, to keep the file contracts alive. But, but I can renew the contract without re-uploading file, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. OK, so, so I guess, is there anything else interesting? Or did we cover almost everything? There's lots of interesting things. Um, so one thing we didn't cover is how the state channels work. Um, mm, but are, these, are they significantly different from state channels? Not really. Use? We, the one thing we have is an update number. A lot mm -hmm. of state channels do have this. A lot, of, a lot don't. But it's basically like, so the file, the file contract has uh, Merkle root, size, end height, start height. Mm -hmm. And then it also has this like revision number which is a uh, uint64. So if you want a file contract that cannot be revised for whatever reason, you just set it to uint64 max. 
-hmm. that contract can't be revised. In practice, I don't think anyone does this because I don't. You you also there's also a renter renter private key, uh, renter public key sorry, and a host a host public key. So you need signatures from both to update mm -hmm. the thing. Yeah. Uh, so that's oh, but, why. But if if I set revision to int max, that means I can close it without. Yes. Challenge period. Uh. Well, I, I don't know if it's implemented, but that that would that would enable it, right? So actually, all you have to do. So there's also a. Um, so there's a success success balance. So, so there's a. I see. Success bal. Uh, success actually success outputs. Um, so the renter gets some money back. The host gets some money back, and it's just how much, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then there's fail, uh, where the renter gets some money back, the host gets some gets some money back, um, and so, and then and then the void it has to add up to, the, and then there's an input, there's a payout, payout up here, these two have to add up to the payout, these three have to add up to the payout, so this is the void, uh, so you have renter host void, renter host, mm -hmm. um, and so in the fail these two are significantly smaller because we destroy money, in the success. Uh, Usually, it's mostly host weighted, but it depends on how much you use the contract. If you opened a contract and then uploaded almost no data, mm -hmm. the host never put in any collateral, the renter never put in any revenue, and so both of them basically just get out what they put in. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you want to close out a contract early, what you can do is you change the start height and end height to just be now, right? Mm -hmm. And then you create the success outputs and fail outputs to be equal to each other. Um, and then It'll just fail immediately, right? The file contract will fail immediately, and the host will get will get paid. I see. Um, and oh, so, so I, as a renter, can just close the contract and pay to the host. Yes. I see. And yep. so that that that's how you'd close. And then on the rate. protocol level, that will not have any challenge period, or, or rather, even if it does, nobody will challenge it, right? Yeah. But, no but one will care. I, get, I see. But but I get no money in this case. All the money go to host. Uh, or there's still something that it de it depends on what the renter and host agree. Because on this channel, right, if I have the channel with the host, uh, it could be that I have more money in the channel that I need to pay for anything we have right now open with them, right? Yes. Uh, so yeah. So like, what what could happen is you put a hundred Sire coins into a channel, right? And then initially, let's say the we close the contract super early. So what's mm -hmm. happened is the renter has paid, you know, ten SC to the host. Uh, so, well, let me break this down a little more. So we have a file contract, renter in. Renter in, we'll call 100 Psi coins. Host in, we'll call uh, 200 Psi coins. Uh, th th these are recommended parameters. Um, and then what's going to happen is uh, if, we've if the renter's only stored a little bit, you might have success look like this, where it's uh, renter gets back, the renter gets back 99 Psi coins, the host gets back, uh, what, what would that be, 201 Psi coins. One side coins and then fail would be renter, renter, 99 side coins, host uh, gets back, that would be 198 side coins, and then void is going to collect the rest, which is three side coins. So, where does this number 198 come from? So, the host was originally at two side, uh, 200 side coins, mm -hmm. the renter. The renter paid one side coin to store some amount of data. Oh, there was collateral. And the host put in two mm -hmm. side coins of collateral. Mm -hmm. um, and so the void gets three in the, in the fail case. But if we want to do an early close, what we would do is we would you know, X out this fail. Or actually, I'd, OK, if we ignore this X, we would, we would X this one out and this one out. And this would go to 201. And this would go to 0. Um, I see. And so such contract can be closed without challenge period. Exactly. Okay. Um, you'd you'd reduce the challenge period to just immediately, mm -hmm. um, and it'll fail immediately. But the failure condition is the same as the success condition. The host doesn't care. Mm -hmm. They get all the all the same money if it had been a success. Yep. I see. <coughs> cool. Um, so you also mentioned that it is cheaper than Amazon. So I in practice, what is the actual yeah uh, compa uh, comparison of prices of of Sia versus Let's say S3. And then we can talk about snapshot backups, uh, which I think are super cool and we should definitely talk about. Uh, and then we can talk about streaming, mm -hmm. uh, which is also pretty cool. But OK, so prices. Um, let me see if I have signal in this room. I just pull up the live feed of our prices. Uh, and I do just already have the page open, because <laughs> as soon as it loads. Storage. 
But, but do you also know AWS prices? <laughs> yes. Upload bandwidth. Um, so our storage bandwidth on the Sci network today, our storage cost is uh, $1.20 per terabyte per month. Upload bandwidth costs 16 cents, 0 0.16 per terabyte. Download bandwidth, DL, BW, uh, is uh, whatever. Um, 83 cents, 0 0.83 cents per terabyte. Um, on Amazon, this is, I believe, $21. Uh, upload bandwidth, I think, is free on Amazon. I don't, I don't think they charge you to upload. And for download, this is about $90. So we have between a 10 and 20x improvement on storage cost and between a 50 and 100x improvement on bandwidth cost. Actually, right now, we're over 100x improvement mm -hmm. on bandwidth cost. Um, so prices are super competitive on the SCI network. Um, that doesn't sound bad at all. Not bad at all. But it, it does surprise me a little bit, because on Amazon, the storage itself is heavily optimized, right? Yes. So is it the case that all the hosts are also some professional? Uh, so some of them are professionals. Yeah. And I think the end game of the SCI network, kind of like uh, Bitcoin mining, they will all be professionals at some point. Mm -hmm. Right now, the, the total amount of storage on the SCI network um, is about 675 terabytes as of writing this video, or mm -hmm. as, of, as of right now. Um, so you multiply this by this, you see it's, it's not that much money uh -huh. um, that's getting paid per month. But as this goes up, I think we'll see increasingly more and more professionals come in. Uh -huh. um, they'll continue to push the prices down. But the real, the real cost advantage, I think, for us comes from uh, a significant relax, relaxing of trust requirements, uh -huh. a significant reduction of barrier to entry. So if you have a, you know, a host on a, on a fast internet connection, you can just buy some hard drives uh -huh. um, and, and offer them up to the network. And, um, and then like, there's no, the, the uptime requirements, 95% is more than you can do on a laptop, but it's pretty easy from just any, you, know, you, don't, you don't need a, a crazy ISP or a crazy uh -huh. power supply agreement. Uh -huh. um, Cool. Yeah. OK, so snapshot. Snapshots. OK. Um, where to start? I'll start with, we won't dive into the technology initially. We'll just talk about the end result. So what I can do is I can upload a bunch of files to the SCI network. Uh, we'll just call myfs, right? myfs. And this could be you know, some, some folder tree, F1. Oh, folder one, file one, file two, file three, et cetera. And I, so I could have you know, a ton of files and a ton of folders. Um, and so I'll just create a snapshot of these folders. Um, so snapshot. And then I can say, save my snapshot. And so when I create a snapshot, it will uh, essentially freeze the metadata make a copy of the metadata, upload the metadata to the SCI network, and then create a bunch of pointers such that in the future, if I lose my machine, my house, whatever, and I have to start fresh, I can grab a new computer, download SIA, put my wallet seed in, and this snapshot will show up. And all the files listed in this snapshot will be recoverable. Um, and I need to know nothing more than my wallet seed to get all of my data back. Um, and this, I think, is uh, the feature that really makes SIA like a viable, proper backup solution. Uh -huh. um, so this is something that's live today. Um, and now I can dive into kind of how that works. Um, and it's actually fairly complicated. Uh, this, this was one, and this, this is a feature we added earlier this year. Um, so it took us almost five years to get SIA to a maturity level where it could, where it could do this. Um, OK, so step one is we have uh, a blockchain full of uh, information. So this, this is the blockchain. blockchain, And in the blockchain are all of our file contracts. Um, so we'll just call this. And actually, they're probably, they're probably all in one, in one period of time. So like right here, I might have my slice of 50 file contracts that belong to me. So when we create the file contracts, all transactions in SIA have this uh, so FC. And then uh, so here's the, here's the file contract. They also have something called the arbitrary data. 
Um, so inside the arbitrary data, what we do is we put a, a color, color, which is really just a hash of our seed appended with um, some extra. This is a little bit of a simplification, but but let's say the host pub key, host pub key. Um, and so if I have my seed, I can see in the file contract what the host pub key is. I know what the color would be of this contract if it was mine. And importantly, because it depends on my seed, which is a secret, nobody else can make a file contract that I'll mistakenly think has my color. Uh -huh. They don't know what data they need. So basically, thanks to, and again, it's a little more complicated than this because it's a little bit safer than just using your seed uh -huh. in the raw. Um, but, but I think one thing we didn't define is the problem, right? Oh, yes. Why, why was it hard? Because, because I lost all my state channels, right? You lost this... everything. So I you see. have no information at all, except mm -hmm. the blockchain, which is public. I see. So we can download the SIA client, which is public. We, we can download the blockchain, which is public. And we have our seed. But we don't have any state channels. And we don't have mm -hmm. anything else besides our seed. And so mm -hmm. from our seed, we have to derive everything else. And so this is why the color is important. We know our seed. We know the host pub key, because it's in the file contract. Mm -hmm. So as we're scanning through, we're going to find I think a million file contracts in the blockchain. That's how many are, are in the blockchain today. Um, and so a million times you're going to check, and you're going to say, oh, nope, this is not mine. This is not mine. This is not mine. But 50 or more, depending on if there's been churn. But some, or if you've done renewals or whatever, some of the contracts you're going to find, you're going to be like, yes, this is mine. Um, you're going to be able to pull out your file contract. Also in the blockchain are a bunch of host announcements, right? Uh, and so what that is is a public key to IP address. So I, I just we're gonna query them for the for the latest state. That's correct. But this is risky, right? Uh, because we don't want them to the know one. Yeah. that we've lost our data. Uh -huh. um, so yes, we so we can identify our file contracts. We know from the public key inside the blockchain. There's also this public key to IP address mapping. Uh -huh. We know what IP addresses to ping. Something that we do uh, in our protocol is that every time we connect to a host, no matter what. We open the connection by pretending we've lost our data. I see. So we're trying to connect. We're trying to trick the host into taking advantage of us. When, but if we didn't lose we the can't. data, we would immediately slash them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we we immediately know that they're cheating. We know not to use them mm -hmm. anymore. Um, but so the one time that we do, we we have no ability to double check if they're cheating. Um, they don't know. Because our behavior mm -hmm. is identical yeah. to all the all the other situations. So but as, ask, long, as long as one third is cooperating, we're fine, right? So what you can actually do is you can give. And we don't do this yet. Okay. Um, this is something we'd like to like to add. But what you can do is you can put the entire state. You can put every state channel on every host. Um, so every time you connect to a host, you can ask them for all your state. Okay. Um, and this actually creates an interest. An oh, interesting so then even, incentive. Even if at least one is honest, that's yeah, fine, right? Then mm -hmm. you can get everything back and. Hosts are all in competition with each other, right? So the other people that I'm using are, are this guy's competition. This guy, you know, the honest host, actually kind of has an incentive to have his dishonest competitors go out of business. Mm -hmm. So he actually wants to give me, he may not want to give me uh, my channel state for him, but he wants to give me my channel state for everybody else yep. so that I can penalize everybody mm -hmm. else. Um, and so there's just this like nice little uh, second layer incentive working in our favor. But this uh, this particular feature of always requesting as if we lost data, yep. was it added as part of this change with snapshots, or, or was it also needed before for something? Uh, so it wasn't needed before. We, we've been planning this for a long time. So mm -hmm. we've had that behavior in the network for a long time. Um, but uh, we, did, we did add it specifically because we knew we would need it mm -hmm. uh, down the road. Yep. Interesting. Inside, uh, so now now we have our file contracts back. We have our state channels back. Mm -hmm. We still need some way to uh, fetch the metadata. And so basically, the first uh, a file contract is okay. This is kind of interesting architectural stuff. I'm gonna zoom out again. How's the file contract orchestrated uh, or managed? So we have a, a file contract. Today, file contracts are broken into two. Uh, sections. The first section is a um, like a fixed fixed data section, fixed section, uh, and then the second section is a uh, random access section. So 
So uh, the fixed section is where we store a pointer to when we created that snapshot. We actually uploaded it as a file. So somewhere in this random access section, there's a there's a file that has uh, you know snapshot snapshot, and then that snapshot, of course, O T. That snapshot, of course, will point to all the other files mm -hmm. that we have. Um, so here we have a pointer, and so we'll just look at this is index zero. Um, so in index zero, we have a pointer that says this thing, this root, is a snapshot. Um, so most of our files are stored by their Merkle root. The host keeps a table on its side that goes from Merkle root to data. And mm -hmm. so if I ask the host for a particular Merkle root, it can give me the data. Um, I know that it gave me the right data because I just I hash it up. I yeah. see if the Merkle roots match. Um, and then what that means is that when we want to do something like deletion, uh, what we can do, because so if this if this is a million nodes long, which on for some fi file contracts, that, that's four terabytes. A million nodes is four mm -hmm. terabytes. If it's a million nodes long, we don't want to have to recompute the Merkle root across four terabytes of data. That's mm -hmm. way too much hashing. Um, so what we do instead is we will swap this guy with the tail, oh, and then mm -hmm. we only have to do logarithmic number of operations. Mm -hmm. Instead of sliding everything over, we do a swap. We have yep. the tree cached. Log number of mm -hmm. updates. We get a new Merkle root um, nice and easy. Um, Oh, we have the tree cached for a four terabyte file. That's pretty big. It's not too bad. And we don't cache every layer. Just the top ones? We cache, yeah. So, so the big one is we cache every four megabyte. So we, we cache every four megabytes. And then I think there's a second layer uh, seven above that. Mm -hmm. So whatever four megabytes times two to the seven is. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, actually, I do know. 512 megabytes. Mm -hmm. uh, we save another. Yep. Save another hash. Mm -hmm. um, so that this allows us to uh, do things efficiently. And then something we're rolling out in the next three months or so is garbage collection. Um, so if you want to, so the delete operation I explained we don't actually have right now. Um, this will eventually be. Broken up into three sections. You'll have your fixed section. So one question I have is why why is this not the very first file? Random. Coming again? Why why is the actual snap why is snapshot not the very first file that that they have? Like why would it not be just at the beginning so that they don't have to look it up? Yeah, because um, then we can repair the snapshot. Uh, we can make changes to it. I see. Um, also, we can make a bunch of them. So if we have like. Actually, I, th I think the correct answer is so we can have a bunch of them. If we have 50 different snapshots, mm -hmm. um, it becomes a pain to try and front load 50 things and keep them ordered. And like, and then when mm -hmm. we want to prune them or delete them, figure out how to do that when they're all in fixed. So we like the snapshots to be random access, so that if we want to shuffle things around, mm -hmm. it's free. Fixed, the fixed section, everything's referenced by index. So it means whatever's there can't move. Yep. Um, and we have no flexibility to touch it. If, if you delete something in the middle of a fixed section, you can't reclaim that data. You can mm -hmm. only wait until someone wants new fixed data to mm -hmm. go there. Whereas in the random section, we can just pop things around a bunch because we don't. Nothing points to it by index. Everything mm -hmm. points by Merkle root. Um, and so that's why snapshots go out in the random section because it's so, easier. So, so to this is a file contract between me and a particular host, right? Yes, you and one particular host. So our snapshots. Uh, oh, and that's the other thing. So every host has the fixed section. Uh, this is replicated. If you have 50 hosts, your mm -hmm. fixed section is replicated across 50 hosts. Mm -hmm. But your snapshot can be uh, erasure coded. I see. Um, and so the snapshot, which can be quite a bit larger, you know, the, the fixed section, the pointer to the snapshot is you know, either 32 bytes, or if you've erasure coded the snapshot, maybe it's 32 times 50 mm -hmm. bytes. It's, yeah, 32 times 50 pointers. But the snapshot itself, we can erasure code that. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to. Yeah. We don't have to fix 50x replicate yeah. it. So, yeah, a couple a couple of good reasons to keep the snapshot in, in random land. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, so the last thing we wanted to cover is streaming. Streaming, video streaming. Um, so yeah, and this is really just tip of the iceberg for uh, engineering engineering advances on the SIA platform. Um, but one thing that we're really excited to be able to support is video streaming. Uh, and Fuse, 
which is file system and user space. Um, what this means is that you can mount uh, SIA as a drive on your computer. And so something like VLC or Plex Media Center will recognize um, the folder that is actually a SIA folder as a normal file system folder. Um, and so we're working on an integration with Plex called SIA Stream that allows you to put your media library onto the SIA network and then stream from it um, to any of your any of your Plex endpoints um, and and view your content. Um, so that's that's like one interesting use case um, that we're we're rolling out for the SIA network. Cool. And so the idea, so streaming works because effectively, like the I'm already streaming my file from the from the host, right? Yeah. So I guess, but it is erasure coded. Oh, but it's erasure coded in chunks. So I like I. I I recover one chunk. Yeah. I, I, uh, I replay it. I recover the second chunk. Yep. And then because so the the actual erasure coding bits are I think divisible down to sixty four bytes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't think we have a specific vocab word for for the sixty four byte mm -hmm. segments, but they um, but so if you want just the first like say you know two megabytes of a 40 megabyte chunk, mm -hmm. you can download just the first two megabytes. Nice. You don't have to download the whole 40 megabytes. Cool. Um, and that makes it a responsive streaming platform. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. So we covered everything? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> There's way more. Awesome. Uh, yeah. OK. So that was fun. Thanks a lot for uh, coming and uh, talking about SIA. SIA. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, I thanks for how having to pronounce me. it. Awesome. Thanks a lot, everybody. Until next time. <laughs>